Welcome, everybody, to the 10th annual Martin Gardner Celebration of Mind. Uh, normally, this time of year, we have uh, all around the world dozens of local events celebrating Martin Gardner with, with talks and demonstrations and things. And uh, being uh, a COVID year this year, uh, the Gathering for Gardner Foundation has decided to do uh, a virtual event over Zoom that anybody can can log into and watch. So welcome. This is our first day of, of seven, and this is our last talk of today. And um, so our speaker is Steve Butler, who's going to be talking about math and juggling, where it's, there's a wonderful connection there. There's been a lot of research, and uh, it, it's just uh, really... Um, the math behind the, the juggling patterns is really cool. And I think you're, you're all really going to enjoy this. Um, logistically, I'm going to hand over to Steve, who's going to play a 35 minute uh, pre-recorded talk. And um, after that, we'll do, we'll do questions. And with that, I will hand it over to Steve. Thanks for joining me as we talk about math and juggling. Before we begin, I want to take a few moments to talk about how I became interested in this topic. Ron Graham. Ron Graham is an amazing mathematician. Publicly, he's maybe most famous for Graham's number, this uh, larger-than-life number. So big, they had to come up with a new notation to even describe it. But he did so much in mathematics, and uh, his papers are all available online and maintained at a site, rongraham.org. You can learn a lot more about him by visiting that site. And one of the things that Ron was very well known for was his performance. You see, he wasn't just a good mathematician. He was an amazing communicator. He had a way of connecting with people. Of course, this goes back to when he was very young. He trained as an acrobat. And he was a profession at the trampoline. And he carried this sort of physicality throughout his life. So when he talked, he would use body language. He'd lean in and back using his hands to emphasize the points. And then, of course, the repeated words. Well, maybe, maybe. And he was just an amazing, singular person who really changed mathematics in many ways for the better. Now, one of the things that Ron did was he was president of the International Jugglers Association. This, of course, was way back, 1972. But he was also involved with the mathematics of juggling. Now, you might see, look, he is a juggler, and if you look, there's a lot of balls in that picture, a lot of balls. And if you're very patient and you count, 12. Now, a non-juggler would say, wow, that's amazing. And a juggler would say, wow, that's too amazing. That's a little bit too good and uh, better than world record. On a side note, Ron's daughter, Shay, is an amazing professional at Photoshop. If there's a celebrity who needs to look five years younger or a few pounds lighter, they go to Shay. So, well, hmm. Well, Ron did a lot of work on the mathematics of juggling. And it's through Ron that I started getting involved in looking at the mathematics of juggling. So, I want to talk today a little bit about the very basic things, some really simple results to show, well, why does math get involved? And what are some things that we can figure out about juggling using mathematical tools? Now, the first thing we have to think about is how do we talk about juggling? It's a really strange idea. You know, how do we communicate patterns? Now, it might seem simple now. Of course, you say, well, we can communicate a pattern. We'll just record a video and, and send a video. You could imagine a hundred years ago, maybe some jugglers are mailing back and forth to each other. And how would they communicate their patterns? Would they say something like, hey, I'm, I'm working on that elephant with the reverse purple thurple on the back end. And what? <laughs> the, the problem is that if you try to develop your own vocabulary for describing patterns, you'll just soon discover everybody has their own vocabulary and it's not clear to communicate. So probably one of the first ways that math can come in is learning on how to describe patterns. Even just the description of patterns really gives a lot of power 
Because once we know how to describe something, we can start thinking about how to explore and take a look at what are the possibilities. So how do we think about how to describe? Well, we can imagine that there's a pattern. Now, if you have a, a person who's juggling, we could say, look, here they are. We'll, we'll draw them down here. And uh, they're juggling some sort of pattern. And so they have the balls going in the air. And we'll have them walk forward. Now, as they walk forward and they're juggling, the, the balls are going to be going up and down. And what happens is we can trace where the balls are. And by figuring out where all the balls are, we can sort of trace over time what's happening. So maybe this is the arrangement that we see as we track our juggler walking forward. Now this particular pattern, it's actually one that does have a name. It's called the baby juggling pattern. And where it gets its name from is that there'd be some juggling acts where they say, look, we got to get all the props that we possibly can involved. And so one of the things they said, well, we have kids, we got to do something with them. So they would put a young child in one arm, they'd have some balls in the other, they'd throw the balls up really high, and while they were in there, they would switch to the other arm, balls come down, and then they throw the balls back up, and they'd switch back and forth. So you'll notice that there's one ball that's staying very low. That's the baby. And then there's two balls which are going high. So this is the baby juggling pattern. Now, how do we describe it? Well, we can start by thinking, okay, we're going to think about time as marching to a beat. And we think about, all right, how many beats do the balls land in the future? Right? We throw the balls. They're going to land at some point in the future. How long does it take? So what we can do is simply count. So if we start here, this will land over there. One, two, three, four, five beats in the future. And the next one, it'll land one, two. All right, and here, one, two, three, four, five. And then again, one. All right, here, one, two. And then five again, right? One, two, three, four, five, and so forth and so on. Now, what we're going to see is that we really care about patterns which are periodic. In other words, they repeat. So what this pattern does is it actually repeats every five throws. And so if the base of it is this five, two, five, one, two. So we think about the pattern and now we say, hey, this is the pattern five, two, five, one, two. And now you have a very simple way to communicate. It's like, oh, by this sequence of numbers which corresponds to the throws, I can absolutely communicate what the pattern is that I'm doing. And then the person who I'm communicating to says, ah, I pick up, I know what you're saying, I can figure out what you're doing, and let me see if I can do it too. So now we come to the question, well, what are the throws? Well, one throw is zero, right? Aha, zero, zero, zero. No, nothing gets, happens. It is possible. We do count zero as a throw. But of course, it's not the most interesting. And you can say, well, what's the next one? One. And one says, in one beat I catch. So it's going to be really quick. Doom, 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 doom. Two would be two beats. Doo doo, doo doo, doo doo, doo doo. And uh, you might say, well, look, because it's just going right back to the hand, we oftentimes represent it by just holding on to the ball. So there you go. That would be two. Of course, if you do it with both hands, this is the juggling pattern too. Look, I can juggle. Woohoo! All right. Well, of course, there's more interesting things. Three would be three beats. And it looks very simple in between the two hands. And of course, you can imagine things get more complicated. You have four, you have five, you've got six, you've got, ah, no. well, you got really, you can go to any number you want. See, the nice thing is we're doing theory. And theory says, look, go as high as you want, no problem. So we have these sets of throws. Now we can say, wow, let's take our patterns, our juggling, and learn to describe it by these throws. So what a lot of people call the three ball cascade, well, 
which looks something like this, it, we say, look, we're going to call that the pattern three, because every throw is three beats, three, three, three. The three ball shower, well, that's going to become five, one, five, one, because a big throw, low throw, big throw, low throw, big throw, low throw. And then there are some patterns which really don't have a, a non-mathematical name because it really required the mathematics to help discover them. Things like four, four, one. So four, four, one, four, four, one, four, four, one. You know, up, up, across, up, up, across, up, up. It's a beautiful, beautiful pattern. And now we can say, aha, here's ways to describe them, ways to differentiate them. On a side note, you might say, well, wait, has, has mathematics ruined juggling? Well, look, where's the, where's the art? Where's the, where's the showmanship? No, no, there's still lots of art left in juggling because there's all sorts of wonderful, fascinating things you can do. You can do various hand movements. You can have your hands go back and forth. This is like Mill's Meth is a very famous example. On a side note, Mill's Meth is named after Stephen Mills, who learned to juggle from Ron Graham. Oh, all right. Well, even more impact that Ron had. Okay, so now we have our way to describe things and communicate things. But let's th think back to what we have. Currently, we're saying, hey, let's think of it as this big, long, essentially infinite line. Well, that's probably not the right way to think about things because we're thinking about periodic patterns. And when we think about things in a, in a big, long, infinite line, it's like we're just going to copy one little interval over and over again. And there's a better way to think about it. And so instead of a big, long, infinite line, we can think about things as wrapping around so that as we move forward, we just wrap around. Now, what's the advantage to that? Well, it's like a circle. And so what we do is instead of saying, look, we're going to copy what we did before, we say, no, 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 it's not copying, it's we reset because we've come around one period. And so that becomes a better, more efficient way to think about what's going on. In terms of our pattern, five, two, five, one, two, we can now say, look, if we think of our circle going around, then we can draw our throws. We have a five, a two, a five, a one, a two, and so forth and so on. Now that we have a way to describe using our mathematical tools, we can start doing all sorts of wonderful questions. So the very first question we want to look at, it's one of the most basic questions we can ask. I have this pattern. How many balls do I need? So maybe I got a mail and said, hey, just checking in. I'm working on this beautiful juggling pattern. It might interest you, and here it is. And they have a, a list of numbers that it corresponds to. You're like, wow, that sounds fascinating. Let me reach into my drawer and pick up some balls so I can try it out myself. Well, how many balls do you need to grab? What's the correct number that you need to do to carry out this pattern? So that's our goal. How many balls if what I have is my list of throws that I need to make? To answer this question, we're going to use a little bit of string theory. And not the fancy string theory you hear about in physics. Literal string. And uh, this is a proof I learned from Ron. Ron Graham told me this. And uh, there's lots of proofs. But this one, once you see it, I think it's like so intuitive. And it just, it's, it's a beautiful way to think about what's going on. So we're going to do an example where we have five throws. And in particular, we're going to say, look, the pattern that we're interested in, is the pattern where we're going to go 12, then 5, 6, then 2, and finally 0. So those are our throws. 12, 5, 6, 2, 0. And now, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to lay it out. So we start with 12. So here we go. We throw 12. What does that mean? Well, we're just going to go around 12 beats. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's once around. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That means we're going to need to go twice around. And then we're going to need to go 
two more beats, and therefore, that's going to be how far we go. So, there we go. That throw of 12, when we think about what it traces, it's going to take that much to cover it. That's our amount of string. Now, how about for 5? Well, okay, so we'll start here, and we're going to go 5 beats around, which means we're going to come back exactly to where we started, and that's perfectly okay. You can start and stop at the same place. All right, for six, well, all right, what happens there? Well, we're going to start, and now we're going to wrap all the way around once. That's five plus one more. And so we're going to end up there. There we go. And how about for two? Okay, that's pretty short. So what do we have? We start here at two, and whoop, there we go. And uh, we start here, and we go over two more throws. There we are. And zero, we don't need to add anything. Because a zero indicates what? It says, look, all the balls are currently way up in the air, and at that beat in time, none of the balls came down. So we're like, okay, great. No problem. No problem. Now, there we go. In essence, what we're really doing here with our string is saying, let's think about our diagram. We're just looking at it. Now, the question, how much string is there? And you're probably thinking, I don't know, quite a lot. And this is a, a lot of, of yarn here, Steve. Well, what do you mean how much string there is there? So what we'll measure is, think of it by beats. So one way we could say is, well, look, each one of these throws, we put some string down. So we had the 12, the 5, the 6, the 2, the 0. So, you know, 12 units of string, 5 units, 6 units, so forth and so on. So that would be 12 plus 5 plus 6 plus 2 plus 0. All right, you add all that up together, and uh, we end up with 25. Is there another way to think about how much string there is? Yeah, see, look, what we can do is say there's five beats, or if you like, the period is five, and at any given time, if we look at our layers here, how many layers we have, well, it's the number of balls that we have. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So there's always five as we go around. One, two, three, four, five. Which means we take our period, five, uh, times the number of balls, which is five. And we come to the thrilling conclusion that 25 is five times five. <sighs> You're probably like, well, that doesn't seem very exciting. But what we really have done is said, hey, there's two ways we could have counted it. And we compare the two answers. This is actually a really interesting mathematical way to look at problems. You say, hey, there's more than one viewpoint to understanding what's going on. And if we combine these two viewpoints, since they're equal, we can get some interesting insight into what must be true. So for us, our insight says, hey, let's compare our string. Like, how much string do we have? Well, one way to figure out was add up the throws. The other way to figure out was, hey, let's take the number of balls times the period. They have to be equal to each other. And so, since the sum of the throws is the period times the number of balls, we come to the conclusion that the number of balls is the sum of the throws divided by the period. Or, put another way, it's the average. So if I have some set of throws, then it must be that the average is how many balls that I'll need to juggle the pattern. So that's really nice, because one of the things that we come to a conclusion of is, hey, sometimes I might just have a list of throws and I, I can ask the question, is, is it possible to juggle this? And the answer is, well, maybe not, right? Because there are some times when you take the average of a set of numbers, you don't get a whole number. And it has to be that we have a whole number. It's like we can't juggle a pattern with two and a half balls. And you probably think, wait a second, two and a half balls? That can't be that hard, right? What can you do? Well, you just take two normal sized balls and like one small ball, right? That's two and a half balls, isn't it? Isn't it? <laughs> no, give me a break, give me a break. No, no, that's not how juggling works. And so we have a nice, very simple test. Aha! The, the average of the throws, that's the number of balls, has to be a whole number. 
But <laughs> here's where things get a little bit, uh, just because your average is a whole number does not mean that it's a pattern that can be juggled. So what could happen? Well, take four, three, two. Now, could we juggle that? Well, if you take four, three, two, and you take their average, well, four plus three plus two is nine divided by three, it's three. So that's a whole number. But if you think of what's going on, if you throw four, then three, then two, then uh-oh, uh-oh, they all are coming in together at the same time. Trouble, trouble, collisions, terrible, terrible. Now, you might say, well, what do you mean? Well, one of our basic assumptions is we say, hey, when we're juggling, we can only hold one ball at a time. Now, there is a version called multiplex, but for right now, we start with the basics. So what it looks like when we have collisions is it might be the following. It might says, look, there's already something in the hand, but something's trying to come in. Ah, no, ah, no, ah, no. It's just like, ah, see, the problem is there's just not enough capacity. And so that's not going to work. The good news is it's almost true. Now, what do we mean? Well, 432 can't be juggled. 234 can. So 234 is a pattern that can be juggled. In fact, it's not a bad pattern. So we turn to a more interesting question. If your average of, of a set of numbers is a whole number, can you rearrange things so that the result is juggleable? All right. And I'll just go ahead and tell you the spoiler alert is yes. And we we'll want to take a little bit of time saying why, how, what? So let's uh, think about it. So we're going to start with a really nice observation, which says, hey, if we have a pattern of period n, then what we can do is we can add n to any throw, and it's still a pattern. Or we can subtract n if we have a very large throw, and it's still a pattern. Our intuition says, think about what's happening here. If, I, if I'm going around, if I add n, it just says add an extra loop going around but you'll still connect in at the same places. In other words, where you start and where you stop are still the same. Similar if you subtract in. It's very similar to the idea of how clocks work. If you think about time moving forward, eventually you'll come back to 12 o'clock. And then you say, look, we're not gonna go to 13, we go back to one. And so we say, okay, we can reset. The fancy mathematical word for this is modular or modulo where we can say, hey, we really don't care so much about the value, we just care about up to adding or subtracting a particular fixed number. Now for clocks, we do it modulo 12. Of course, we could do it for any number we want. So if we have very long throws, we can pull our throws back by subtracting n off until we're sort of in our sweet spot. So we can assume that all our throws are between zero and n minus one. So that says, look, well, we don't allow negative throws because we don't like to think of things going backward in time, but we also say, look, we don't have to have very long throws. Anything n or above, I could have subtracted n off and pulled it back. So that's good. It really says, hey, we only have to focus our attention to whether or not something is possible by saying, okay, what if we only have the numbers from zero up to n minus one? Let's suppose n equals five. So I have five different time points. I'm gonna call them A, B, C, D, E. And I just cycle through this. Now, what happens is I say, look, at every time point, there's gonna be a throw and there's gonna be a catch. And so we say, okay, we throw, there's the times A, B, C, D, E, E, and there's the catches, or when we land, A, B, C, D, E. And what we'll do is in the board, every square gets a number, and the number corresponds how far do you have to throw to get from where you started to where you end. So for instance, the two, where we have a start at B and an end at D, 
says two steps. A zero, start at C and end at C, says, look, I don't even have to throw at all. I'm already there. Or if we start at D, end at B, well, that's one, two, three. And so now we have great, perfect. Here's our different throws. So what we're going to do is we're now going to place some rooks. Now, we'll actually not use rooks, we'll just use little tiny beads here. And you might say, why rooks? Well, what's true about rooks is they have a nice property when we think about boards. Rooks are allowed to move any amount in the horizontal direction and any amount in a vertical direction. So when we talk about rook placements, what we want to do is we want to say we want to put little tokens, our rooks on the board, in such a way that no two are in the same row and no two are in the same column. It's not so hard to figure out ways to do it. There's many ways to do it. And uh, so for instance, you might say, okay, how many rook placements are there here? Some people might say, oh, five. Other people might say, five! <laughs> of course, the correct answer is indeed five! Uh, five factorial. So it turns out that there's a, what does factorial mean? Okay, factorial, we talk about five factorial, it's really five times four times three times two times one. You can think of it saying, look, in the, the first row, ah, I have no restrictions. I've, I can put it anywhere, so maybe I'll put it here. In the second row, well, I can't put it there because there's a restriction. Otherwise, I'm good to go. Well, wonderful. And now in the third row, okay, so there were four choices. In the third row, there's only three choices left. And then in the fourth row, I'm down to two choices. And then in the last row, I just have one. So I had five in the first, four in the second, three, two, one. So that's where you get five times four times three times two times one, also known as five. Okay, good. So there we go. That's how many ways there are to place. But look at this. What do you see? Well, because it's a rook placement, at every time there's a throw, every time there's a catch, so it's a juggling pattern. And not only is it a juggling pattern, we can actually read off what juggling pattern it is because we read off the throws. At time A, we were a three, then a zero, a two, a two, and then a three. So it goes three, zero, two, two, three. And we could even sit down and figure out, oh, well, the average is a two, so it's a two ball juggling pattern. And yes, there are two ball juggling patterns which are hard. So don't just assume, oh, okay, it must be easy. So there we go. Wonderful, wonderful progress. We've now gone a beautiful way to describe what's going on. All right, now what's the goal? Remember our problem says, suppose the average is a whole number, can we make a juggling pattern? Now we can rephrase it saying, hey, can we put the rooks down so that the numbers that we cover are the numbers that we started with in our list of throws we want? And so that we have a proper rook placement, no two in the same row, no two in the same column, because that would mean it's a juggling pattern using the throws that we want. Perfect. That's what we want. So, is it possible? Yes, yes. And this is uh, sometimes called Hall's Juggling Theorem, named after Marshall Hall, who was not a juggler. He was a, a mathematician, sort of an unintended consequence. So he, he wasn't planning to prove a math theorem that relates to juggling. He was just doing math. And people came along and said, hey, there's an application for this. I'm going to give a, a brief sort of algorithmic argument. It's not going to be a complete because I'm not going to prove correctness that the algorithm works, but I'll tell you what the algorithm is. And this is based off of work by Ron Graham and his collaborator, Joe Bueller, who came up with a very simple procedure. It says, look, if you do this procedure, you'll always succeed. And assuming that you start where your set of throws, zero, 10 minus one, and that uh, the average is a whole number. So it's a very simple idea. Remember, we're placing rooks so that they cover certain values. So we're thinking 
every rook is associated with a particular value. It's our throws that we started with. And now we say, okay, for every rook, we go through and do the following. We, we take that rook and we're gonna place it on the board. And we put it, we go to the first available row. That's the first, we say available row, the first empty row. That's the first available row. And we find the number, we put it down. Now, two possibilities, either perfect, no problem, or, whoops, something in the same column. Now, if there is something in the same column, whatever rook was in the same column, you pick that up and say, okay, where's the first available row for that one to go? And put it down. Now, it might be that, ah, another problem. Well, no problem, just keep going. And the result, it's a beautiful result, says, look, you eventually will succeed. In other words, you're not going to get stuck in some loop where you're like, oh, there's a problem, there's a problem, 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 problem. Back to my original problem, 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 problem. No, no, no. You will always resolve all of your problems and therefore you'll succeed. This is perhaps best illustrated by doing some examples. So let's think about some possible examples. So our first example, suppose that we want to place 24013. So in other words, we want to end up with the numbers 24013 covered by our tokens in some way. So our procedure says, start with your first one. So this is a two. So we find a row, the first empty row, first available row, and cover the two. Well, okay, there it is. Well, no problem, success. Oftentimes putting the first rook is very easy on a board. Now we go to the four. Okay, well, we go to the first available row, our second row, we put the four down. Okay, no problem there. Perfect. Go to the next one. This is a zero. First available row, put the zero down. Say, so, uh-oh, conflict. Okay, we're going to pick that up and go to the first available row. Well, that would be the D. Put it down the two. Say, so, uh-oh, conflict again. All right, that's a four. Pick it up. The first available row would be the first row. Put it to four. Conflict's resolved. See, this will always happen. That's the beauty of this. And that's, by the way, the part that's being obfuscated. We're not going to cover the details. Why? But it always will work. Next one is a one. Okay, put the one. Uh-oh, conflict. Okay, that's a zero. And so where does that go? Well, first available row is the last row. Put it down. Uh-oh, conflict. No problem. That's a four. First available row is the third row there. And... No more conflicts. And finally, we put in the three. Well, only one place to go. And that, by the way, this is where we use the fact that the average is a whole number, is to guarantee that when you put the last one down, there is no conflict. And you can check. See, there's a two covered, there's a four covered, there's a zero covered, a one covered, and a three covered. Now you might say, were there other ways to cover the numbers two, four, zero, one, three? And the answer is yes. In fact, there's lots of ways for this particular set of numbers. But what we're trying to argue is that there's at least one. And so this says, hey, here's an algorithmic way to produce it. It's kind of a nice thing because oftentimes in math, there's sort of two different ideas that are saying in existence, we know that there exists one. How do you find it? I don't know. It's out there somewhere. Good luck. But then there's like, uh, I'm going to produce one. And it's nice to be able to say, I know how to produce one. It's somewhat even stronger than saying there exists one. And you might say, wait, it's possible in math to know that something exists, but not be able to show an example? Yes. What a beautiful subject. Math is great. Let's do a second example. So suppose we have the throws we want are three, two, three, two, zero. So let's begin. We pick up our first one, it's a three. First available row, put it on the three. The next one is a two. First available row, put it on the two. Uh-oh, conflict. Pick it up, it's a three. We move to the first available row and cover the three. All right, now our next one is a three. First available row, that's a three. Ah, conflict, pick up the one that conflicts. Move that to the next available row. Cover up the two, because it was a two. Ah, conflict. Okay, move that to the first available row. Cover up the three, and we're done. 
All right, well, what's next? The two. And first of Elbow Row, well, put it down. There's a conflict with the three. Okay, pick it up. Find the first of Elbow Row. Well, it's the last row. Put it down. We're good. And finally, put down the zero and success. Success. There's a three covered, a two, there's another three, another two, and a zero. So this can be juggled as three, zero, two, two, three. And there we go. There we go. Beautiful pattern. Thanks for taking the time to come and learn some more about math and juggling. It's a wonderful topic. We've only started to talk about it. There's all sorts of interesting connections. There's juggling in cards. There's juggling and walks and networks, and there's more and more. In fact, there's even things that we don't know. And uh, there's so much left to figure out, which is great. The world is full of problems, and we still get to explore them. If you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit the website jugglingcounts.org. This upcoming spring, I'll be posting a series of lectures for a class I'm teaching about math of juggling. And eventually, there will be a book coming out about juggling and mathematics called Juggling Counts. So there's so much to look forward to, so much to learn. Like in juggling, right? Once you master a trick, someone will say, sure, you can do it with six balls, but what about seven? Uh -huh. All right, more to do, more to do. Thank you very much, Steve. That was, um, was a wonderful talk and a wonderful tribute to Ron as well. Um, Side swap juggling is, is just really fun stuff. And that was a uh, fabulous um, hands-on illustration of lots of different ways to think about it. And now Steve can answer you uh, by voice. There's multiple ways to think about uh, how to represent juggling patterns. So the site swap, I like to think of it in terms of the board because then you can talk about rook placements. But there's sort of have developed two other interesting directions. And I don't wanna say there's just three, but uh, there's three main ones. So the site swap, which I like to think of in terms of, of boards. And then there's uh, juggling cards, which uh, comes out of Aaron Berg and Reddy. And uh, there's also the uh, way to do it by what are called uh, state diagrams, which keep track of when balls land. Now, somebody asked a question about two-person juggling. And has people thought about the math about that? And uh, actually, Ron has a paper with Joe Bueller that uh, addresses that. And uh, you can represent that in multiple ways. One of the ways that probably is the easiest to think about it, uh, and unfortunately it's hard to explain because there's, uh, it's kind of visual in, in some sense. And uh, let me see if I, I can try something here. And, uh, and uh, so there's this notion of what's called the juggling cards. And the idea of juggling cards is you're gonna focus on the order. So in other words, we care about the relative order of the balls when they land. And so what typically happens is you say, look, there's maybe we'll say three balls up in the air. And the first ball is the ball that lands because we're thinking of the balls as being how they are, but a relative position. And now we say, okay, you're gonna throw it. Well, what happens is you're gonna throw it and it's gonna land relative to the other two in some place. So maybe you throw it so that it lands before the second ball is currently in the air, but not before the third ball. So then you can say, aha, at this time step, that was the effect on the ordering. And then you can just basically take out a deck of these cards and by putting them sequentially one after another, you can form these sort of diagrams. It's the same kind of diagram that we saw at the very beginning where we had jugglers going forward, but of course, it's a little bit more stylized. Now, how do you get to multiplex? Well, what you do is, sorry, not multiplex, but multiple jugglers. What you do is you still have the cards, there's still balls in the air, but then we say there's not one place they come down, but balls come down in two places. So we say the first ball comes to the first person, 
and the second ball goes to the second person. And now they throw them up again and they just have to somehow end up in some certain tracks. Now they can switch the relative order or, or they can stay the same relative order, it doesn't matter. And then the balls just drift down again. But now every single possible pattern can be described by a sequence of cards and the number of cards is finite, it's known, and you can compute it. And so we can go through and do a lot of uh, mathematics by looking at these cards. And I think that's one of the easiest ways to talk about how do we handle juggling with multiple people. It turns out there's a connection to a part of mathematics known as posets. So juggling patterns, passing, and posets, I believe is the name of the paper, uh, Ron Graham and Joe Bueller. But yeah, in general, multiple people, multiple balls, it really increases the level of difficulty. And uh, you might think, uh, look, juggling must be easy, right? We must know everything about juggling. And uh, no, no, there, there's some really tough problems out there. Uh, a few years ago, I worked with some students where we were able to make progress on understanding two ball patterns. <laughs> and and uh, you might say, two ball, wait, wait what? <laughs> we struggle with two balls? Yeah. And uh, because the state of the art was we understood one ball. <laughs> that was known for, for many years. And then there's, uh, it's, the, the technical term for it is prime uh, juggling patterns. And essentially the idea is that a prime pattern is one where at every single beat in your period, it always looks different. And so, so you never come to a point where it's like, oh, maybe a third of the way through, I'm exactly like where I started. No, no, no. Prime says every, every single beat looks different to you. And uh, so how many are there? Well, we know the answer for one and two. <laughs> for three, we have balance, but that's as good as we can do. Uh, we, it's kind of hopeless right now. And uh, so, yeah, there's, it's hard. But I mean, in some sense, what is juggling? And uh, the way I, I like to think about juggling is it's studying things which are discrete. So we think, you know, regular time intervals, dot, 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 and periodic. So it's really the study of discrete periodic patterns. And there's other phenomena that really are exhibiting discrete periodic patterns. So you can think of juggling in lots of ways. One way you could think of juggling, what if you were in, in space? Not like on the moon, but, but actually in space, you know, zero gravity, what would juggling mean? Because if you throw the ball up, it's gonna keep going, okay? That's not a good thing. Um, but what you can think of happening is that you can say, well, juggling in space can be, uh, instead of the ball coming back to your hands, you can say, look, the balls will stay put, and now you move your hands and, and touch the balls at various points. But from the perspective of the patterns, it's still the same exploration. But now you think of, okay, so if I'm just moving and I'm moving the balls in some pattern, it's a lot like drums. Dun, 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 dun. So you can say, okay, so the same mathematics for exploring the pattern of juggling, explore the patterns of, of ways to play drums that are periodic. And so, you know, there's all sorts of phenomena out there. All right, sorry, I've been rambling for a while. No, that's really great, Steve. We, we do have a question in the Q&A window, if you can uh, pop that oh. up. Okay, well, okay, so the question is about uh, videos of different patterns. There was uh, a DVD set that came out a couple of years ago called Sight Swaps. And uh, I don't think they had all the patterns, but they had a lot of patterns. And so it's, uh, it's probably a lot of the fairly most common patterns up to, I think they got maybe six balls. They may have gotten a, a, a seven ball pattern there as well. And uh, so uh, for that, uh, if you wanna see an actual person, uh, you, you probably should wanna track down that, that uh, DVD set. So it's called Sight Swaps. If you're looking for, look, I'm willing to accept a computer. Well, there's lots of apps. There's a website that was mentioned in the chat and you can put anything in. And uh, so some programs, they would say, well, what if you wanna throw really high? You know, 
Because look, humans are limited. But, uh, well, there's other computers. Look, I don't care. I can throw a height of 100, whatever, no problem. So uh, a program was written, so it said, all right, we'll start, if you want 10, that corresponds to letter A. And then 11 is B and so forth and so on. And so you can now start typing in words and say, okay, is this word juggleable? Can, can you actually juggle it? And so Ron uh, found out that there were two interesting mathematical words that were juggleable yeah. at this convention. And one of them is, is theorem. <laughs> and you, you see this little teeny tiny stick and there's these balls and they're like pixels, but you know, they're all going up and down. And the other one was proof. And now it's even tinier and there's more balls and it's going up even higher. And, and so Ron said, look, this is a juggling demonstration that proofs are harder than theorems. Ball collisions in the air. Uh, I remember there was a video, uh, sorry, a television show where they had people with a high speed camera and they were filming uh, a juggler who was pretty good at uh, I think seven balls and they, they were filming. And uh, at the end, they, they played it back and uh, they actually showed, oh, there was this point where the balls collided. And he's like, what? I didn't know. You see, what oftentimes happens is that jugglers have been practicing for so long, they've learned the error correction. It's like, oh, I see that, oh, there's an error. And they know instinctively to move their hands. And of course, where do jugglers look? They don't look at their hands when they're juggling. They'll, they'll look up there. So you gotta, it's one of those things where you have to learn to have complete confidence in knowing where your hands are. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, when it comes to mathematics, there's a lot to worry about. Now, there is an interesting case though. Okay, so there's a, a, a Japanese uh, juggler slash mathematician. I think he actually went to the gathering for a gardener. And I feel bad because I, I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. But one of the things that he, he constructed was a sphere. And it was a plexiglass sphere. So as you could see inside of it because it was clear, transparent. And then there was a hole. So you could reach in. And what you could do is you'd take a ball and you'd put it on the top and then you'd roll it. So it would roll around on the inside and you could catch it again. But of course, there are many ways, directions you could roll the ball. So you could have multiple balls rolling at the same time along different, what you would call great circles. And so things were, were sort of rolling around and rolling around. And then the question becomes, okay, well, what patterns can you do? It turns out it's a hard question because you see, when we think about juggling, what we worry about is collisions in the hands when the balls come together. We just say, look, the collisions up in the air we're going to assume it doesn't actually happen or, you know, jugglers can account for it. But when you think about it on the sphere, there's, okay, there's the hand, that's the North Pole. You also have to worry about balls coming together at the South Pole. One extra potential collision spot. Ah, oh, uh-oh. That makes things tough. And uh, we do have ways to count for very basic ones, but yeah, even in, like, a clean theory. So there's a, a very nice result that says that the number of patterns, if you say I want less than B balls and period N, the number of patterns B to the power N. Wow. Now, of course, a mathematician hears that and says, wow, that's amazing. That's beautiful. That, there's got to be a reason for that. And they get excited and they figure it out. Now, that's for normal patterns. Spherical juggling, forget it, hopeless, hopeless. We have no idea. Well, you know, you always have to leave something for the next generation, right? So more to do, more to be said. All right, thank you, Steve. Again, that was fabulous. Thanks for the wonderful talk and for the, uh, the great uh, answers at the end as well. And again, just fabulous tribute to, to Ron Graham, so thank you.